This week, we're talking to Lisa Messenger. Lisa is an entrepreneur and an author. She's also the founder of The Collective Hub, which is where you can find her beautiful books covering everything from personal growth to business topics. She's here with us today to offer advice on starting or scaling a business. We know many of you dream of starting your own biz, and we're here to remind you it's never too late. She's also full of great advice for those with no intention of starting or scaling a business. Please enjoy today's conversation with the open and always authentic Lisa Messenger. Lisa Messenger seems to be one of those names that has rung in all of our ears for so long when it comes to a woman who just gets in there and does it. But how would you describe yourself if people ask you for the first time or meeting you for the first time? Oh, thank you, Shelley. It's so beautiful to be here with you. I was waiting for the big, but actually it's really nice that I get to do it myself because sometimes I feel like a complete tosser when someone else like reads the big bio and you're like, oh, really? <laughs> um, I guess for me, I kind of um, describe myself as an entrepreneur for entrepreneurs, living my life out loud, showing that anything is possible. And yeah, I dip in and out of all sorts of different modalities every single day. But this is my 21st year of having my own business. And I've written, I don't know, 38 books or something now. So (laughs) there's little that I haven't failed at, a few things that I've had some success at. So, yeah, I'm pretty much an open book, quite literally. (laughs) That is, And your books have uh, covered so many different topics. I know there's ones there, you know, gratefulness journals, um, ways to sort of disrupt and, and get busy. But this one, Start Up to Scale Up, is obviously bringing your 20 years of business into one beautiful book and I do suggest if anyone is looking to decorate their bookshelves this is just a side note that if you've got (laughs) Lisa's 17 titles there on your shelf a you're prepared for life as we know it and b your bookshelf is going to be stunningly dressed Um, because they are there's there's this lovely mix of coffee table book with just incredible wealth of, of knowledge in there so this one start up to scale up It took you two years to write. Uh, So obviously it was very clear it was important for you to get this one right. Yeah. So it's really funny, I should say, I mean, for anyone who doesn't know about my books, so most people, as you know, write a book because they're the guru of something. I'm like generally quite the opposite. I kind of choose a topic and then I go, I'm going to learn everything I can about this and like write it in real time. So normally I love, love, love writing my books. So I've written one called Work From Wherever when I decentralized my office after a bricks and mortar office for 17 years. And I was like, okay, choose a title and then like live it and learn it and write about it. So Start Up to Scale Up was um, kind of like pulling teeth in a way because it was retrospective as opposed to me jumping in and living it. So it was almost a bit more painful for me to write because I had to go back and like trawl through, okay, how do you ideate and how do you, you know, all of the things. But I hope and I think that's probably the most useful book for people so far. So, yeah, it did take a long time to write. It's 400 pages. (laughs) Um, But, yeah, I'm really happy with it. And everything we do, we design so beautifully because I think it's really important. People, you know, learn in different ways. So I want it to be like lots of listicles and lots of dip in and dip out and lots of summaries. And so it's not like this huge tome of war and peace that takes everyone forever to read. (laughs) that beautifully presented that you can easily digest the information that's in there and if you do drift off for a little bit there's some lovely pictures there to look at as well. (laughs) I know and you know what I used to put myself on the covers of all of my business books of which I've written seven before this one and I was like oh I'm so overseeing myself so I was like um (laughs) as I'm aging as well no I (laughs) I'm kidding I'm just trying to put that into the the podcast title um but I just thought it is really important that people have something beautiful and linen that they can put on their coffee tables as well and hopefully they read it but if they choose not to it just looks great (laughs) as well. (laughs) Well, it's beautiful and it sits there in your face all the time, which I guess comes down to that starting a business. You don't just choose, I suppose, the first idea that pops into your mind. It's usually something that's been burning away and burning away for a while. Um, I guess it really starts with self-belief, does it, to, to kick off a business? Yeah, thank you. And you know this better than most. I think for me, it's really interesting when I wrote this because it is a bit like choose your own adventure. So I always start with mindset. So the the first whole sort of section is around 
mindset and self-belief and purpose and confidence. And my fiance, who's an amazing businessman, he was like, oh, no, 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 no. I would start with product. So I'm kind of put it into three sections, mindset, product or service, and then marketing and distribution. Um, but yeah, I always start with that because I feel like unless you have that strong mindset and that strong self-belief, it has to be unwavering. You have to want it almost more than you want to breathe because you will get knocked down, you know, tens if not thousands of times. And still nearly 21 years into having my own businesses, I still get a lot of no's and, you know, and your ego can come into and be like, don't you know who I am or all sorts of other stuff. And so it's really important to have that, you know, internal self-belief as opposed to needing that kind of external validation so much. I'd love to say we worked on that in series one and we're all in a prime position now to kick (laughs) off with what we do know, we have that self-belief, we have that yes mindset. Um, Were you always a, a, a strong mindset person from the beginning or is this something that you work on and have worked on your, your whole life? No, it's something I've consciously and purposely worked on and um, you can go as deep on this as you want. But, I mean, I think it's really important that people know that, like, my life um, – So I gave up drinking 17 and a half years ago and I kind of call it Lisa pre giving up drinking and Lisa post giving up drinking and like the pre um, giving up drinking, I actually spent most of my 20s like suicidal and, you know, really depressed and didn't have a sense of self-belief or purpose and no emotional intelligence and really had no semblance of who I was. Sorry to go dark quite quickly. But I think it's important for people because often all we see is this kind of, oh, wow, you have this like successful business or you've written books. And it's really important that the only reason that I have got to that space is that, um, you know, I kind of got tired of my own BS and I was like, I need to consciously make a change and that wasn't easy and I often say to people you know don't necessarily stop drinking I mean we have more alcohol in our fridge than anyone I know (laughs) we love a party it's just that I choose not to drink it but I would say that it's really important and I know you would have covered this in season one to find out what you are doing to self-sabotage or keep yourself small. And so for me it was very much around putting down the alcohol and then starting to um, put in the work and work up you know, what my triggers were and what was holding me back and, you know, my pain points and my traumas and all of that stuff. So it was really a lot of years of therapy and a lot of, um, you know, self-discovery across a number of different modalities across the world to kind of get me to this kind of pretty solid, grounded space. But yeah, it, it took a lot of work. And you're still working on yourself every day. Do you have those daily practices that are a must before you even uh, leave your bedroom? Yeah, absolutely. So right now I have a shirt on the top, but on the bottom I have my um, <laughs> my leggings because I've just come from a, a Barry's boot camp class where I've been like running like a crazy person. So I do. So, I mean, we are recording this podcast at 10 a.m. And I actually um, have a ritual where I divide my day into two. And, you know, listen to the similarities, not the differences. But basically what I've decided that works for me over the years is pre 10 a.m. is Lisa time. It's like filling my cup. It's proactive time. So that's when I meditate, um, I journal, I listen to podcasts Mm -hmm. and I do my kind of exercise. So it's me time. And from 10 a.m. it's like game on. Okay, well, let's go. Now that won't work for everyone, but I would suggest Um, to find rituals and routines and disciplines that you can fit into your life and that do work for you and this is just what works for me it's it helps me to be grounded and start the day in a really strong way rather than like you know opening my phone at 6am and being like oh my god the world's coming at me so (laughs) I've become much more conscious and purposeful about how I start my day. Isn't that amazing? So business doesn't even infiltrate your day until after 10am and then you know that you're in the best place where you're going to be able to give it everything you've got. Yeah, generally. I mean, I'm a little, you know, like like all of us. Oh, we all bend a little bit. Because I love what I do, right? So it's hard not to like pick up the phone and just be like, what happened overnight? Or, you know, Shopify is on my phone and we have, you know, our books are in like many countries now. So I watch what's happened overnight or whatever, but I try to not do it or I try to minimize it and then kind of start responding and reacting to the world after (laughs) 10am. 
Now, your business didn't start as uh, holding, as you said, over 30 titles. Uh, the Collective Hub, obviously, is this ever-evolving, ever-changing thing. What was your first and original business idea that has now grown into, obviously, this multinational platform? Thank you. I almost sort of chatted more about that than now because I feel like that's the stuff that's actually useful for people. So I started my first business on the 21st of October 2001. My fiancé, oh, I have this ridiculous um, head for dates. I don't know why. I can tell you when I, the date I gave up drinking, the day I started my first business, the day I got engaged, like everything is Well, that means you have cause for celebration almost every day. This is, <laughs> this is fabulous. Exactly. People just laugh at me. I'm like, oh, this is where this, this is where this. So the reason I started my business then was pretty much because I got fired. But I say that with like the biggest <laughs> smile on my face because it was like the perfect thing and it was the most beautiful kind firing imaginable. <laughs> so my boss basically said to me, I think it's time you do your own thing because I think I was oh, That is like, kind. <laughs> I, I, look, if I was reading a school report card, I know exactly what that means. <laughs> Yeah. And he was so kind to me and because I think I was a pain in the butt. Like I was always saying, I want equity in the business. I didn't even know what equity meant back then, but I just like, or I want to do it my way. And so, I mean, I got a lot done for every company that I worked for prior to starting my own business, but um, I was a real pain. And so he kind of let me go out the door. And I remember I had $4,000 to my name and I was working prior in conference and event management and sponsorship. So and the sponsorship part of my job was probably the most important part. So that was only for eight months, but I was doing the sponsorship. So financial deals for Cirque du Soleil and the Wiggles and Barry Humphreys. And it was actually those eight months that pretty much formed the basis of everything I went on to do because I learned how to negotiate and how to swap. Um, that There were more currencies than cash, really. So you could have like, what is this and what can we swap for it? So I started basically a, and I do inverted commas here, um, an integrated marketing agency, which was ridiculous because I wasn't trained in any way, shape or form. And it wasn't a clever way to run a business because um, someone would say to me, oh, can you help me with a marketing plan? And I'd be like, amazing. Or can you help me write a business plan? Amazing. Can you help me do some sponsorship? Amazing. So like many people who start out, you have this humongous passion and you're so excited about it all but when there are no systems and processes as I had none and I was kind of reinventing the wheel every single time someone was um, you know in, engaging me to do a project it was actually ridiculous because I was swapping time for money and it wasn't scalable at all mm -hmm. and I continued on in that way for about three years and then I hit burnout frustration resentment <laughs> and so yeah so we can talk through more of that but it is very important even though it's almost counterintuitive for someone who wants freedom and choice to actually have disciplines and rigor and mm -hmm. systems and processes and be able to repeat things in order to scale just a quick you must try it pause our sister platform has taken off and we're grateful for all the love thank you very very much women across australia are shopping our must try products dr anna Quebecca's products the three warriors faced tan mist and the lamav bb cream have been hot items from day one if you haven't checked us out already please do we'd love to support your aging well journey with the products that we've discovered you must try com is where you need to go now Back to the show. Business has changed so much in the last 21 years since, since you kicked off. And I know mm. sort of finishing school in the early 90s, it was all about going to uni and locking in a degree and having a real set direction of where your life was going to go. And to me, that's now out the window. You know, you mm. can have a great idea, but ultimately a small business or a startup business, you are going to be having to do all the roles, whether it's the, the CEO and the accountant and the lawyer um, and the ideas person and the driver behind it. You don't really have that one skill, but you do have to have that one passion, I would suggest. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's interesting, isn't it? And to be honest, I only went to university eight years after I left school because I felt like, um, I felt back then a societal pressure, I think that was probably because I, as I talked about, I didn't have that sense of self-belief or an inner knowing. And so I kind of went um 
and did it a degree part-time just almost to tick the box. I went on to be alumni of the year. I think they wanted to claim me as their own several years later because I actually went on to have some success, ironically. But very much now, I think, um, and I love that the education system is changing and it used to be very, you know, convergent. Now it's more divergent in terms of it's almost like you can pick and choose your own journey. And you're right, when you start your own business, you are pretty much everything. So I think I always say to people, if you're looking at starting your own business or anything in life, I say to find your purpose, there's kind of three things that I break it down to. Number one is what juices you up and excites you and makes you want to jump out of bed every single day? Like, what do you really love doing? And the second piece to that would be do start to listen for a while to that external validation. But, you know, as I said before, not too much. But if people are like, oh, my gosh, Shelly, you're a great communicator. Oh, my gosh, you're a really effervescent. You know, you're great at detail. Whatever the thing is, just start to listen to that at the beginning and take it on board. Mm -hmm. And number three, if it's going to be a business, then is there some commercial viability? Is there a market there? Or if not, maybe it's just a hobby. My fiance for my last, last birthday gave me a set of decks. So I am dying to become a DJ. Oh. Now, will, will I make money? Why not? That? Why not? I would, I say. Say, <laughs> I would say it's probably not a money spinner for me. So in that case, I go yes to the passion. Yes, people go, I've got some beat. Is there a commercial reality for me? I don't think so. That's probably a hobby. So they're the kind of three things that I often kind of put myself through. <laughs> I can see you actually if you're, you're hosting your own uh, mentorships and entrepreneurial programs and you do the DJ lineup as well. I think you could work this in to, uh, to your, no. your skill set. So here's a little secret. I um, I did a gig or I've done a couple of gigs with Richard Branson. DJ with Richard DJ, Branson. No, not DJ, but I've done um, a few big speaking gigs with him, um, which has been amazing. But the last ones I did were in Sydney and then in Brisbane and we had audiences of 7,000 in both cities. And I actually, wait for it, I made a deep house track of me speaking <laughs> to some like deep house and I used that as I walked onto the stage. So there you go. Oh, I love it. it. <laughs> I love it. And I tell you, if I ever have the honour of introducing you onto stage, I'm going to make sure that that is playing. <laughs> I'm a little bit strange and, um, yeah, another thing not a lot of people know about me is that I meditate to deep house before I do a speaking gig, so there you go. <laughs> right, it puts you in the zone. That gets you, yeah, That that's what works for you. And I yeah, know it's, that, that idea of something works for everybody, you've just got to find out what it is. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's the thing. It's very much around, I think people kind of go, oh, to be an entrepreneur, right, I need to only sleep four hours a night. I need to do this. I need to do this. What I would say is like, learn to do whatever works for you. And to put me in that particular zone, I need like really deep, hardcore, like boom, boom, boom. And then I'm like freaking on like Beyonce. So <laughs> that's what works. Oh, I'm loving you more every single minute. Um, you mentioned you do have some very powerful friends and obviously names that we, we know so well as being, um, I guess, the icons of entrepreneurship, uh, Richard Branson being one. Do you look at them now, not so much as mentors, I suppose, but were they mentors of yours in the beginning and, and now they are colleagues? Yeah, yes. And I mean, the thing about that again, and I love Shelley that you kind of started this conversation with self-belief. I think it's really important to people to be able to meet people as equals. And I say very consciously the word meet, because I feel like too often people kind of put themselves in a, oh my gosh, you know, this person, it's amazing. And what happens is when we elevate others to such a degree, we actually sometimes forget who we are or what we bring to the table. And a good example of this, sorry to name drop, I'm totally not a name dropper, but I'm using this purely as an example. Um, when I launched my print magazine in 2013, in the end of 2014, I had this email, which I'll never forget, which said in the subject line, from the office of Anna Wintour. <laughs> and anyone who knows her from kind of Devil Wears Prada, September issue, you know, kind of the doyen of publishing. And Anna asked me to go and meet with her in New York. And interestingly enough, I put it up on social media at the time. Oh my gosh, I'm going to meet with Anna Wintour. And the majority of the comments were, oh my gosh, what are you going to wear? And I found that interesting because mm. 
she had asked to meet me and I was like, of course I had a stylist, but, <laughs> but it wasn't about that. It was about I needed to go into that room believing in myself so that I could meet her as an equal. And we were talking about licensing Collective Hub into the US at the time under the banner of Condé Nast. That didn't happen for various reasons. But it's really important that we all level up and that we all believe in ourselves and know that we have something to bring to the party every single day and I just got shivers I am the, a beginner at something every day mm -hmm. and that is because I purposely continuously put myself into difficult counterintuitive situations every single day mm -hmm. whether it be um, I don't know, trying sailing out or soft sand running on the beach or anything that I do, I'm continuously pushing myself beyond my comfort zone, which means every single day I am a beginner. And I want everyone listening to this to go, even though I've been in business 21 years, I am beginning every day something and also in business and I'm still not getting it right, but I'm failing fast and I'm iterating and I'm pivoting. Blah, that's the word of 2020, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I can't stand it anymore and moving, like learning from the lessons and moving forward. But it all comes down to that positive mindset again, doesn't it? I mean, you can you can psych yourself out with so many things and walking into oh. rooms with those powerful people would be a moment for most people to go, I am depth out of here. This is just, you know, too much for me to take on board. But then it's a pinch yourself moment as well. Oh, my God, I'm here. So I really do have to step up now and have that self-belief that I am very much entitled to be in that room with Anna Wintour or whoever it may be or just going in for funding for for your new startup business I have every mm. right to be here and to back myself on this and it's yeah. all mindset yeah a hundred percent a hundred percent actually a segue from that would be the floods recently which you and I am talking about in the northern rivers both kind of jumped in and did a lot and you were amazing um but things like that I mean I had no idea what I was doing on day one I just and I still don't, but I just saw something that needed to be done. And I think any of us can step up at any point if we believe in ourselves and we're able to use whatever platform we have, whatever voice we have to actually orchestrate change. So I think everything, you know, at the core is about mindset and self-belief and just being able to step up and into, you know, when there is a calling. The positives, oh, it just still makes me emotional. The positives to come out of, <clears throat> excuse me, what we experienced up here in the Northern Rivers, rivers and then what has obviously filtered down uh, further into New South Wales too is the amount of people here that did step up, Lisa. It was extraordinary. And not everyone is a chief and I would never call myself a chief. I'm, I'm a very good Indian. Um, point me in the direction you need me to go and I will work my butt off for you to get it done. But there were some extraordinary tales here of, you know, 20-year-old yo yoga instructors that were out there leading the charge. And I just can't wait to see how those people's lives are going to evolve and change and the growth they had through such a traumatic experience. Um, can only better our region up here and I really do thank you for being so integral in that and the greatest leader that we had here on the ground and I don't say that lightly because there were some extraordinary people around but you were beyond and and certainly inspired so many people to just keep digging deep when there was nowhere else to go and um, and I do think you have created great change up here and I do believe a lot of people would have learned so much from you during this experience that they can take onto their rest of the, their lives um, and I, yeah I can't wait to see what that does create up this oh, way and you. all those game changers that you now have <laughs> out there as your not your minions by any means but no. um, they certainly have this little LM tattooed on their arms and they are going for it. <laughs> uh, well and you but um, yeah I think the Northern Rivers I mean I'm in Sydney at the moment but the Northern Rivers is definitely home now and always I mean I've never experienced anything like it the most extraordinary people just you know banding together in the sense of community and I think that really comes back to you know a sense of um unified purpose mm -hmm. and everyone kind of banding together so yeah I mean out of that horrendous adversity which continues obviously with so many people displaced etc um came just the most extraordinary sense of community and I think bringing that to a business segue I really think people 
I can't under, underestimate the power of community. And when I, um, for those who don't know, I launched a, a print magazine in 2013 called Collective Hub. But people often say to me, um, because it was in 37 countries within 18 months, and people were like, oh, my gosh, you know, how? And I was like, well, I had no experience in magazines or media, and people said print was dead or dying. But why that worked was I truly believe if you give people a chance to belong and, um, you know, and you let them be part of something and part of a story, people actually just want to join forces and do that. And again, you know, the birth and, um, you know, the continuation of Collective Hub through those years was very much because it was community driven. And I used to say I might own it financially and most days I wish I didn't, <laughs> but I didn't own it. It was a community really that owned it and, and carried it. So that is... I think for anyone starting a business and in life, if you can really create something that has a beautiful, um, you know, vision and mission, then people will help you and they will carry the message for you. And then, Lisa, how do you monetize that? Because ultimately it does come down to financial reward. You know, we would all love to be philanthropic in our, in our pursuit for, for greatness and delivering to others, but ultimately to keep it going and, and to keep that passion there and to keep that um, community alive, there needs to be some financial reward in there. Should that be the first thing you think about, the second, third, fourth? Where does that come in the program? So, I mean... I would say this, I could not care less about money for money's sake, could not care less about it at all, really, but it absolutely does buy freedom and choice. And if we're going into business, then we need to be realistic about, you know, some commercial gain if um, it is only to let you to continue. Mm -hmm. Because um, I wrote an entire book in 2014 called Money and Mindfulness, which is actually probably one of my favorite books, Second to Start Up and Scale Up, because it explored the notion of there are more currencies than cash. And actually, this is so important for anyone who's starting out or anyone who's at any stage of the business. A lot of what I do is I think about what am I creating and what are my saleable, tangible assets? Like what have I got that I can swap? And I think this is really important. So I'll often be like, particularly when I'm starting out, I was like, okay, I need to get a website built. Okay, well, what can I offer? Okay, well, I can speak, I can write, I can, you know, do a number of other things. And so I always think about what's in my toolkit that I can swap and barter with someone else. And that is actually, I've done way, 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 way more deals with no cash mm -hmm. over the years than with cash. So I think also for people who um, potentially use money as, well, I can't do this because I have no money, I would say, well, think differently. Like, what do you have? So a lot of it is around that. But I would also say definitely um, get intimate with your numbers and your data, particularly if you're kind of a creative visionary like me. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come naturally to me to, you know, know about the numbers and the HR and the IT and the legal. Like I do not like the operational side of the business, but it is absolutely imperative to be able to keep it going. So you've got to at least have some semblance of an understanding. And I could talk about that for, you know, 10 weeks solid probably <laughs> about what not to do and what to do. But really it's, it's important to understand, you know, how much can you spend? What does it cost to create something? What is the potential margin, you know, because how can you scale? Um, we just worked out we've actually sold 4,100,077 books to date. Oh, my God. <laughs> like that. That, was, that was as of Thursday last week. And what so, date was that, Lisa? That was, <laughs> Lock that in to your memory bank, another day to celebrate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was just because I said to um, my CFO, Chief Financial Officer Kate, who's been with me for about 14 years, I said last week, how many books have we sold, like, out of interest? And um, so what happened, I mean, and, that is majority of the last kind of three or four years. But what I said was, you know, when we're now at the scale we're at where we're printing every single um, run we do is minimum 10,000 and we're often doing multiple reprints every single week. So I cannot afford as much as I would like to, to take my eye off the ball in terms of data. Like every single day I'm being fed data and numbers and it's an absolute imperative um, so I don't sink the ship. In 2017, I very nearly sank everything and lost everything. So it can happen. <laughs> 
And is that where you start, you think, okay, I am the ideas person and I am the creative, so my first employee, whether that be my life partner um, or whether it's taking on a business partner, they have to fill that gap, don't they? Like it's, it's one thing to have the idea but it's never going to turn into a business if that's all you've got. Yeah, it's such a good point. And, I mean, then this can come down to sort of ego or identity and all sorts of other things, but I would definitely say hire your weaknesses. So for mm-hmm. me, I know I my absolute genius zone is being um, a visionary, a creative. I almost call myself a brand architect. I kind of work out exactly where I want to go. Um, I'm kind of the person who does, you know, a lot of the deals and the negotiating and the non-monetary deals, and I love the partnerships and the collaborations. I'm horrible at all of the stuff I said before, the operation stuff. I mean, I'm not so horrible now because I'm 21 years in, but but what I need to hire and what I need to have around me are data-orientated detail implementers, so people who actually get the stuff done and slice and dice everything and feed me the information because if I was doing that all day every day, a, I'd be really bored and B, I'm terrible at it and it would take me forever and I'd get cranky. So understand and make friends with, um, you know, what you're great at and what you're terrible at. It's really important. And is that a good thing to do straight up? Because obviously that idea might not be financially viable. Your first idea that you think is an absolute winner If somebody actually ran the data on that, they could say to you, it's a brilliant idea, but as you said before, it's a hobby. Lisa, you are not going to be the highest ranking DJ in the country. (laughs) Keep that as your hobby. Uh, Find something else to monetize. And you might go through a few ideas before you actually hit the one that is going to be self-rewarding enough um, that the public are going to want, love and need and is also going to make you some money along the way. Yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, find someone, be it a bookkeeper or someone who can just, or a friend, you know, again, swap some time for doing something and get them to run some numbers. But there's an even more simple way to do that. And um, I've used this example a lot of times and I want everyone to, you know, time this because this is how quickly um, you can come up with an idea. So some time ago, I said to a friend, you know, what are you passionate about? And he said, I'm passionate about food. I'm passionate about travel. I'm passionate about Bali. So that was like really quick. And then I was like, okay, let's test that idea. Would you want to run foodie tours to Bali? And literally, this is pretty much as complex as I start with any of my business ideas. So then, because we can get real-time feedback from social media, and if you don't have a social media following from friends or focus groups, you can very quickly. So in this instance, I said to him, throw it up on Facebook, ask people, would you be interested in a foodie tour to Bali? No money asked for at that time, just that simple question. Now, if people come back and go, oh, my gosh, amazing, yes, only, and this is how I run my business all the time, only at that point would I start to spend time and due diligence on working out, okay, what do I think that's going to cost me to run? Okay, well, it might cost me, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then I go back and I put up, okay, the foodie tour is going to be $2,000. Are you still interested? And if people kind of go, nah, then knock it on the head, pivot, iterate, try something different. If they're like, that sounds amazing, then I go a level deeper. So my point there is we can test and iterate quite quickly um, you know, because there's so many people willing to give us an opinion or tell oh us. God, that was so bloody simple. I can't believe it. <laughs> but I do it every oh. single day. If people watch my socials, so mm-hmm. Lisa Messenger or Collective Hub, every day I'm pretty much testing things like that mm-hmm. before I actually do it. Because so many people when they're starting a business or, you know, scaling a business will go, you know, I'll write a 100-page business plan or tick everything off and, you know, cross every T, dot every I. And by then you've spent all your time, mm-hmm. money, by the time you actually land the thing, there's no market or the market's moved on. Mm-hmm. So just test and iterate really quickly all the time. Amazing. amazing. That has to be one of your biggest learnings in the past 20 years, is it? Yeah, I think so. I just think we often overcomplicate it and or people, you know, think, oh, I'm not going to tell the world about this. You know, I'll keep it to myself until I'm ready to launch. Yes. It's going to be perfect. But, you know, there is the old adage, done is better than perfect. So I think just like, you know, just test ideas and see. And then you also might get to the point where you go, it's going to be $2,000 for your foodie tour to Bali. And then you go, oh, this doesn't feel right for me. You're still in its infancy so that you can actually pull out and there's oftentimes I'll put something up 
and either the audience, it's like crickets. I'm like, hello, is hello, is social media broken? You know, I, guess <laughs> I thought that was back. awesome. <laughs> Oh, so yeah. And then other times I might get some way into a project and then I might think, oh gosh, this just doesn't feel on purpose. You know, Mm -hmm. this isn't exciting me. I don't feel, I call it being, pardon me, in flow or walking through mud. So sometimes if it's like, oh, just everything feels icky and it just doesn't feel right, then I'll often just cut it anyway. Even if there's a market, if it doesn't feel right, I'm just like, I just don't want to do it. What still drives you then today? Is it that that light bulb moments or those new ideas that come to you all the time? Is is that what this is all about for you now? Is to just keep going and just keep coming up with new ideas and new creations? Yeah. So I this is not mine. This I heard from um, a friend of mine, Jason Silver, years ago. But it really stuck with me. He said, "I don't want to." make a billion dollars I want to impact a billion people and I feel like what keeps me excited is primarily I share through books and also digital tools but I love 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 coming up with an idea and kind of going ah I'm going to like learn this and then I'm going to share the lessons learned and that's actually what kind of keeps me excited we're just um expanding into the U.S. in a pretty big way at the moment so my my latest thing is ah I want to write a book exactly about like how to expand into the US. So it keeps me kind of accountable and it keeps it interesting for people because um, it, it's kind of like doing something in parallel. It's like a choose your own adventure, but then it's actually useful for other people at the end. <laughs> so that's generally how I do things. I'm like, wow, I'm going to like jump in, boots and all, I'm going to try this. And then I'm going to like write about it and share with other people. Mm-hmm. And if you hit that dead end somewhere on your choose your own adventure, you go back four pages and try try a different way. Yeah, and, you know, sometimes in 2017 when I did nearly lose everything, I mean, that's um, when I had the magazine and I'd had it for nearly four years and but I just scaled too quickly without the right systems and process in, some processes in place and I had this, like, huge brand which everyone was loving but underneath I was hemorrhaging cash and spending pretty much every night on the bathroom floor crying. It wasn't pretty. So I came up with this title, right? It was, like, Risk and Resilience and I was like, okay, I'm going to write a book while I'm in this and I'm going to get through it. And so that's where I've trained myself to kind of mindset flip and go, okay, I'm in the middle of adversity. I'm going to write a book about it. I'm going to get out of it. Problem is, as I started writing, I got further and further into it and the book was like getting worse and worse. I was like, oh my God, I'm losing even more money. I bet I did, um, I did publish that book and it's probably horrible for me to go back and read but it's probably like one of the best books about kind of a cautionary tale about what not to do even if I'd stepped into like the greatest version of me and the the greatest incarnation of my purpose but I just went too fast so yeah so that's a good book to read for anyone who's thinking of scaling fast that's it and you wouldn't do it any other way I guess if you could go back and start again from the beginning uh having learnt all those ways what would your first three steps be now um I think and and by the way I'm really glad that I nearly lost everything because you don't know until you're somewhere and now I would say bigger isn't necessarily better but I didn't know until I went there and it was so big that I was like whoa 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 pull it back a bit (laughs) um the three steps I would say are have a really clear sense of purpose and what your why is why are you doing this I mean I think that has to be absolutely number one um number two hire your weaknesses so surround yourself with a great team you don't need to do it all on your own and as I said if you think you know or if you don't have the money think about well what can I barter what can I swap so that's really really important and the third thing would be fail fast so be unafraid to try things but just don't like fail slowly like (laughs) test things and fail and then move on so they're probably the three top tips I can hear 20,000 pens scribbling that down now and getting ready to start. If you could give our listeners one thing to do right now this week to start or scale their business, uh, what would that be? I think just start. I mean, it's so simple, isn't it? But I feel like we, myself included, there are a million things to like do to kind of procrastinate or stop doing it. And the thing is, you know, just, you know, there's that old saying, eat that frog. I always do the hard things 
first every morning because if I leave it, it hangs over me all day. So whatever it is, whether it's a hard phone call or whatever the thing is, I always do it, you know, as after 10 a.m. But first thing, because it's really important. So do the hard things first and just start. Yes, I love it. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, Lisa. I encourage everyone there to start at title number one, work their way through, as you said, go hard, go fast, <laughs> right through to start up and scale up now, your latest release. And look, for your next step, whatever that may be, I know we're all going to be watching on very intently uh, and cheering on your successes so far. Thank you so much for your time today and always and the fact that you are forever giving back to your community and now we feel very privileged to be a part of that. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Shelley. It's been an absolute pleasure to be here with you. Absolutely loved it. Oh, this has been a masterclass with the one and only <laughs> Lisa Messenger. Isn't Lisa Messenger just such a joy? And let me tell you, she is the real deal. She wears her heart on her sleeve, which I love and greatly appreciate her sharing with us today. These were my takeaways from our conversation. Do you need to look at how you start your day so we can fill up our own cup first? Our mindset that doesn't just happen. She spoke of knowing what you're doing to self-sabotage and to work on your mindset. I also love the idea of discovering what juices you up and asking ourselves what makes you want to jump out of bed. And I've noticed that changes over time and with age that it's so important to keep asking those questions because we do change and that's okay. Community was also another key takeaway for me. Like she said, we can't underestimate the power of community. That's something many of our guests have mentioned over time. So thank you so much for listening and please forward this episode to anyone who has a business or dreams of starting one. Perhaps this chat could be the encouragement that they need. Here's to flourishing, growing using our gifts in what we do at every age. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Shelley Craft and I look forward to chatting to you again next week. See you soon.